their uh, mic. Uh, ben, uh, it's about to uh, go live, so it might already be live. Yeah, it is live. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is the first Cosmology from Home AMA. This will hopefully be an annual conference, and hopefully we'll do this uh, annually. We will be answering questions on the Reddit uh, stream, that uh, Reddit uh, AMA that you can see in the description to the YouTube video. If you've come here from Reddit, then we'll be answering the questions that you've posted there. What we're thinking of doing is um, the people in the stream will be typing up their, their answers to Reddit. And if, if and when we see something that we think is really interesting, we'll bring it to the attention of everyone else in the stream. And then we can have a bit of a discussion about that question. Um, some of them might just be interesting discussions because we'll have different ideas about, I see the, the most interest, the most uploaded question at the moment is about what is the holy grail of, of research at the moment. So I'm sure we'll have different ideas about what that is. But we might also have some disagreements about some of the questions, like what is the evidence that we might have about whether the universe is infinite or not, maybe we'll have a nice disagreement. So that's the uh, what we'll be doing. What I think we can maybe start with is just a super quick introduction from everyone who's currently in the live stream. So um, I'll I'll just name you and then you can unmute yourself and have a quick mention of who you are. Uh, so Alex Goff, you're top of the alphabetical list. Do you want to hey. introduce yourself? Um Hi, I'm Alex. Uh, so I'm a PhD student uh, in cosmology studying large scale structure. So I study clustering and uh, interesting statistics, uh, mostly. Cool. Uh, next would be Alexandre. Hello, uh, I'm Alex Hong. I'm a PhD student in uh, cosmology in Stockholm, and I work on uh, CMB experiments. Cool. Uh, Arthur. Hello, uh, my name is Arthur. I'm a cosmology student uh, at Harvard, and, and I, uh, I work on uh, gravitational density. Ben. Hello, I'm Benjamin Wallace. I am a, a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study and the University of California, San Diego in the US. And I'm interested in using different cosmological probes to test fundamental physics. Haley. Hi, I'm Haley. I'm a postdoc in Cambridge in the UK, and I do huge numerical simulations of how um, clusters of galaxies form over time. Robert Lilov. Hi, everyone. I'm Robert. I'm postdoc at the Technion in Israel, um, working on large scale structure formation, trying to understand how matter clusters and also use the distribution of the local universe to constrain cosmology. Robert Reisch. Yeah, hello, I'm the other Robert. Uh, I'm also a postdoc in Israel at the Technion and I work on gravitational lensing and a large scale structure. Stefan. Hi, I'm Stefan. I'm a PhD student uh, also in Cambridge, UK, and I'm uh, working on reionization, so trying to find out how the first stars ionize the universe. And uh, Windsor. Hi, everyone. I'm a PhD student at MIT, and I'm interested in dark matter and 21 centimeter cosmology. Cool. So um, before we started, we realized that there's already one kind of interesting question, which is this um, what I mentioned in the intro. What are future measurements, observations, a cosmologist most excited about? What would be the holy grail? So um, rather than maybe going through everyone alphabetically, I'll do what we do in our conference discussions and tell people to put their hands up. I think Alexandra anticipated what I was going to say, so he's put his hand up. So do you want to go first? What, what do you think is the holy grail? Um, uh, so I'm going to cheat and I'm going to do a whole integrated thing. I think it would be really nice to have like a map of the baryon and dark matter structure of the universe in a light cone from here to the CMB. And I think with, you know, uh, SKA plodding along and all those new uh, very fast, uh, very accurate um, surveys like DESI and such. We, we might actually do that before we all die. So the, the die. audience of this is is the general public. I imagine SKA and the DESI are two words that they may never have heard of. Do you want to maybe um, flesh out what, what they are? Okay, so the universe today is filled with stars and gas, which is usually organized in galaxies and clusters of galaxies. But as we look 
further we look also into the past and at some point there were few galaxies or no galaxies. So for the part where there are lots of galaxies that uh, we can just measure um, using spectroscopy, their distance to us. And, and what is or their velocity? Hmm? What is spectroscopy? Spectrophotometry. Uh, look, I, I, I'm a microwave person. I'm not. <laughs> uh, I, th I think the people who do the the kids and such are probably sure. Not, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I, all I wanted you to say was that SKA was a, a telescope. Oh, a, SKA is a radio, radio telescope that yeah. hopefully will be able to measure um, how neutral height the the emission of neutral hydrogen, which dominated most of the matter in the early universe. I mean, yeah. have probably like it's it's debated whether we have seen that signal yet or not mm -hmm. but anyway we haven't seen a map of it and with the square kilometer array which is a bunch of telescopes currently under construction in south africa and in australia we would be able to see that signal at different distances or at mm -hmm. different times from us therefore giving us some sort of 3d map of the matter at those very early, at those uh, very early universe at that cosmic dawn. Cool. And you also mentioned Desi, which is an, another another telescope. Um, but maybe we can yeah. move on to, to, to other people. Um, Haley, you've you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just want to say that probably the most exciting upcoming observations that all that I'm most excited about is to get more gravitational waves, which I think many people will agree with me on. And especially as a cosmologist at the moment, because I'm sure many of you who are interested in astronomy know about um, something called the Hubble tension. So this is probably one of the most debated things in cosmology at the moment, and cosmologists love talking about this. So basically, all it means is that two of the main ways that we measure the rate at which the, expand the universe is expanding locally uh, don't agree with one another, and quite significantly either. So we get these two completely different measurements whether we look really, really far away at um, the very early universe or whether we measure the local expansion of really nearby galaxies. And the fact that they don't agree is something that's really interesting and we love to debate why and basically no one knows why. <laughs> so gravitational waves, which are these like huge, um, when two black holes merge together, I'm sure many people have heard about it, they emit waves in space time itself, which like stretches and contracts distances, which is like, try to get your head around that. but this gives us a totally different way to look at the universe. So it offers um, another independent measurement of this expansion rate. And this is why I'm really excited about it. Cause I think it's going to give us some really, um, some really interesting insights into where this tension comes from, but that's just me. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Um, we're, we're, maybe if, if people have thoughts on things people are saying, we can um, come back to that later, but I'll let everyone sort of talk about their own Holy grails first, or at least everyone that wants to. So I think next with the handout was, Ben, but unfortunately, it always puts it in alphabetical order on mine. So, Ben, do you want to go next? And then, then Alex and Stefan. Sure. Um, I think uh, some what what previously was said, I, I definitely agree with. Uh, at the moment in cosmology, uh, we've got this huge amount of data that's coming in, which is, I think is, is really exciting. Um, and the next decade or, or two will be. Uh, really kind of a treasure drove of information that we can tap in. And so as, a, as an early universe uh, cosmologist, um, I'm, I'm also particularly interested in uh, really understanding what happened at the beginning of the universe. Um, one of the, the main uh, theories that we currently have for uh, the earliest moments of the universe is uh, cosmic inflation. And so with these future experiments, we hope that we will be able to really find these minute signals uh, that could have been imprinted in our observations. And if we could find anything like this, uh, this will be a huge boost to various parts of physics. Um, and we could tap into these huge, um, these, these huge energies and energy scales that we would never be able to probe on Earth. And I think that would be really exciting if uh, nature was kind enough uh, to uh, have us tap into that. Awesome, thanks. Uh, yeah, then I, said, I think I said Alex was next. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, my uh, answer actually follows on very nicely from, from Ben's, uh, which is, I think, one of the um, sort of smoking gun signatures of, of inflation uh, theories it would be if we could uh, properly detect um, B modes in the CMB. Um, so these are, uh, the, the CMB is the, the earliest light in the universe that we can see uh, from only you know, 400,000 years after the, the Big Bang. Um, and the light that we see from it, uh, you know, we can measure its temperature, but we can also measure its polarization. So which way it's wiggling. And there is a certain way in which it wiggles that we call uh, B modes. And, and these are, um, detecting B modes is very hard uh, because there is a very faint signal and lots of other things create similar signals. Um, but if, if we could detect these, these B modes from the early universe, this would be a, a very good constraint on inflationary theories like Ben was talking about. Cool, thanks. And uh, Stefan's the last one with, with the hand up. Yeah, I want to throw a few neutrinos in the, in the round. Uh, we actually got a, got a question uh, on, on Reddit a, a few weeks back where someone asked us, what would, what would you do with a, a, a perfect neutrino telescope? And I think many of our cosmologists said, observe the cosmic neutrino background. So neutrinos are particles that are all around us, everywhere in space, that are flying through Earth, through humans, through telescopes, through everything, but rarely do anything. So they just pass through without us noticing. And if we would have any way to measure these particles, we could see very far in the in the past and get lots of exciting information. It might not be the holy grail, but it would be really cool. Um, it certainly is fut futuristic. Cool. Um, we had at least. I would one... be happy to oh. add that to my list of holy grails. Definitely. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, so we did have at least one person in our and we're doing this via Zoom, I guess, as you can see. But um, one, one disagreement with someone's holy grail. So, uh, Ben, do you want to? Maybe tell us why you disagree with the statements about the Hubble tension. I didn't. I didn't disagree with the holy grail of gravitational wave observations uh, and using them for uh, for cosmology. I think this is a very interesting avenue, uh, and this entire um, this entire field of multi -messenger, messenger astronomy is very exciting. Um, however, I think that, that there is. As, as Haley said, there's a lot of buzz around the Hubble tension uh, these days. Um, however, to me, it still seems to be too early days to really convincingly say that something is something is wrong, um, just in general with our physical model. Um, I think there, there are a number of different experiments and a number of different collaborations and techniques that pursue uh, measuring the expansion rate of the universe. Um, and at the moment, they don't agree uh, even on kind of very similar data. Um, so it's not clear that this is actually something that we physicists like to call new physics, but it could still just be that uh, we, we, don't, we, we don't know about some astrophysical um, properties of uh, of supernova or stellar environments or so. And uh, that could obscure the, the, real, the real measurement that we want to make. I guess that could yeah, still I, be, oh, sorry. Yeah, Haley, you, you, you're, right. no, you're, the, you're the person that. he's uh, responding to, so you, you, should, <laughs> you should make your response. I was just gonna say, I totally agree, but I think that's a pretty boring explanation. So I'm still gonna cross my fingers that it's interesting new physics. <laughs> I guess by, yeah, by I, like I agree. a literal definition <laughs> of holy grail, the holy grail would be that it turns out to be new, new physics. I guess you're exactly, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Grail. It's systematics. Woo! <laughs> so, Robert, you have um, you have your hand up. Do you want to add your voice? Yeah, I, I just want to actually to draw draw a connection between what what was said already. So, um, another thing to gravitational waves, why they are so interesting is that we just talked about the cosmic microwave background and this is the farthest we can see in our universe because before this the universe is opaque to photons they can't travel um, but if we can detect gravitational waves um, reliably we can basically see beyond this in principle which gives us even more clues about the universe how it looked like before so i think this would be 
would be very, very exciting. Also futuristic, but um, very, very exciting. Awesome. D does anyone else have any holy grail comments or agreements or disagreements on Hubble tension? If not, we can go to another potentially uh, interesting question. Has anyone seen anything that's um, particularly interesting to them? Does anyone know um, anything about example. Betelgeuse? I have to admit, we're, we're cosmologists, not astronomers. I know Betelgeuse has been super interesting over the last 12 months. I personally probably know less about it than the person in Reddit who asked the question, but it's currently one of the most upvoted questions. Does anyone know about the rapid dimming recently and whether it's possible to calculate with I, any degree I, of certainty when it will go supernova? So I believe that there was a study that was published fairly recently uh, that demonstrated that they think that the the rapid dimming was due to uh, basically an out out belch of a, of a bunch of dust um, from from the sort of atmosphere please feel free to correct me if someone else has has read this in more detail than I have uh, this is this is you know coming from the back of my mind seeing stellar astrophysicists talk about it on Twitter mostly um, so if, if someone knows more about this uh, please correct me but that's I believe uh, the the status as it stands. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, Th thanks for that question. Um, we'll, we'll see if we can find an astronomer friend to, to help you with the answer. I found a question I, I really liked. Um, how many times a week does your brain melt trying to comprehend the enormity of everything? So I'll give my answer quickly. Um, not often enough. I, I think when you are doing research, you just lose the sense of perspective quite often and you just end up buried in mathematics or code or algebra or whatever. But Every time I do, and your question caused me to do this, take stop and take stop of everything. Yes, it completely melts my brain. And I think some people have a perception that the people doing the research kind of can understand the concepts, like the scales and things better than the people not doing the research. But it's just that we just we just ignore it most of the time. And every time we do comprehend it, the, the distance scales are just as incomprehensible to us. We might be able to do some mathematics to get some number out at the end, but our actual sort of evolved human minds still can't comprehend those those distances. Um, I see three hands up. I have no idea what order you came because they're all alphabetical, but Windsor hasn't said anything yet. So I'll, I'll let Windsor go first. Yeah, I was going to agree with what you said. I think between like, what, five years of taking math and physics classes, I've become a little desensitized to the word in infinity and like what exactly that actually means on astrophysical scales or energy scales. So, um, I agree, probably don't get my mind blown enough by the fact that we talk about these these enormous numbers, yeah. Uh, Robert, I realize you probably haven't spoken, you've just got the same name as someone who has, but you can go now. <laughs> You're muted. Um, yeah. I actually just wanted to point out a different question that I found also very interesting that I've already started typing answer for already. Ah, so, so maybe if, if Ben, who also has his hand up, wants can to I talk about anything the, else first, then... the enormity one, then, then we can save you for, for the first next question. Yeah, essentially I can just agree with Sean and, and Venser on that. Um, it's usually actually uh, during events like, like this one, when we actually think about uh, the, the numbers and the enormous scales, both on the very small and the very large that we're talking about. In my daily, in my daily life as a researcher, essentially it's just numbers. Um, it's just numbers with a lot of zeros or either kind of in front or after the comma or, or the, the, the dot. Um, and we just, we just deal with that on, as we deal with kind of prices in the supermarket. Um, but then if we try and kind of visualize it ourselves, then yeah, I regularly get my, my mind blown uh, and, I'm, and I'm amazed uh, to, uh, about what we are able to to achieve today in in science and in public green cosmology cool i just want to add one, one more thought before we, we go to you robert um i so, something that i only managed to start doing recently because I, I hadn't crossed my mind before is and in, in the southern hemisphere this is maybe more possible than the northern hemisphere but the, the milky way is very very bright in the southern hemisphere so if you get outside of um because we're pointing towards the center of the milky way here and you guys in the northern hemisphere are pointing out but if you um if you look at the Milky Way, the gravitational well that, that you're looking at is about as strong as the one to the sun. So sometimes when I go out late at night and look at the Milky Way, I can give myself a sense of vertigo as I can kind of feel that 
everything's falling. Of course, we are falling towards it. We're also orbiting it. So you know, we're not plummeting towards the center of the Milky Way, but that's something that I hadn't considered a possibility until recently. And then, then yeah, because like in some sense, we're very, very high up falling into a gigantic deep well. Um, I just wanted to mention that. Cool. Uh, yeah, Robert, do you want to um, talk about the question sure. you found interesting? Uh, I saw the question, like, can we study events that are yet to be seen by us by studying its effects on other cosmic bodies or entities? Plus an additional comment about superluminosity, but let's uh, stick to the first part. And I would say that's kind of what we're doing in astrophysical cosmology all the time. Uh, and seeing the, uh, the effect of, of, of objects on something we know and then see some, some, some deviation from what we expect given our known laws and known observations and then see, okay, that, that hints at something else being there, like start, for example, of Neptune being detected because the orbit of Uranus couldn't be quite explained by the loss of uh, gravity and the other known planets. Then, of course, there's the whole story of the dark matter, which we detected by or which you postulate by uh, seeing that the rotation curve of galaxies and the dynamics inside big groups of galaxies don't quite seem to fit the amount of, of uh, matter that can be seen. And the list just goes on and on. So yes, all the time. Cool, any, any more thoughts, I guess? Uh, Alexandra, you've got thoughts on that? I think Stefan uh, had- Oh, well, Stefan first, okay, yeah. Of... Stefan, you can go first, yeah. sorry. Yeah, I, th I think that's also really cool because there's like there's some events where we can exactly do that, and there's some others where that is like physically impossible, right? So I mean, when there's something that's uh, so far away from us that can, like, no information from there can reach us, then we also can't find kind of any tricks around doing that. Like you know, so let's say there's a supernova explosion one light year away from us. There's no way we can find out about this explosion before the one year has passed and all the radiation comes to us. Um, so then, like in in this case. Like it's just it's this kind of speed of light from a kind of Einstein's theory of relativity tells you that no information at all can like go faster than the speed of light and it's super fascinating because you can use this to do a lot of of theories where you can kind of assume this this principle and then you can rule out a lot of possibilities where you think oh we could do this but then you notice oh no that would allow kind of faster than speed of light travel and then uh, you know okay this probably doesn't work and but on other things like dark matter I think what, what you kind of mentioned where we know. Oh, we can't see that, but we can see the effects of it on other things. That's that's really cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, a Alexandra, and then and then Alex, and I'll, I'll put a stop there because um, there's a few new people who who might want to introduce themselves. Um, but yeah, Alexandra and Alex, you can go first. Yeah, I, I think it's more like. Um, so, if the question is asking, is there something that we cannot see, but we can see? because it's too far or too distant in time, but we can see its effect on something else. Uh, that's, I, don't, I don't think that's possible if the, thing, if the action between the two first objects is less or equal to the speed of light. Because by the time, the, like say, let's not talk about the edge of the universe. Imagine uh, one light second from you so about the moon's distance, um, let's say once light, there's an object one light second from you, there's a second object that appears behind it two light seconds away. And let's say, yeah. So you want the time for, well, let's, let's just keep it to light, but the time for the, um, let's say the, the second object, the one that's two light seconds away starts shining lights. So it will take one light second to go to the first object and then one light second to go for, to us. But because the first object is already one light second away, we won't be able to see the light shining on the first object before the second object has before we are able to see the source as a second object, because, okay, it takes one light second to go on the first object, and then it takes one more light second to come to us. So we can't really see, for instance, imagine there's a galaxy at the edge of the known universe. We can't see it being pulled by things beyond before we can actually see the things beyond. Unless, yeah. of course, something go faster than the speed of light. There was, there was quite a subtle concept you're trying to get across, but I, I, think, I think you did a good job. Um, 
like it, it's hard to tell because I, I felt like I understood it, but it, yeah, um, thanks for that. Um, well, a good point. I mean, the, the question yeah. kind of uh, seemed to, to go into that direction. I, I, will, I will include both kind of types of answers uh, for Reddit. Okay, cool. Uh, Alex, you have, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, no, so, so my point was about the sort of two-sidedness of this question, which is I think, because as people who really understand causality, because we, we have to uh, for, you know, the, the work we do, it, these, these things, uh, it's really easy to, to not read the question as sort of as intended, I think. Um, so I think as intended, it probably is like asking about this, or the, the way I read it at least, is asking about whether you can have, you know, the effect on, of something on something that we uh, can see and whether, you know, the, these are causally connected to each other so they can influence each other. And we could learn about this thing through this one, even if we aren't causally connected to that. And that I think we all can agree isn't isn't true. But I think the the point that um, Stefan was making is really interesting because, in a sense, the, the, this finite speed of light is the entire reason that our field works and that astronomy works in in general. Like, if if the propagation of light was infinite, you know, we we couldn't look back in, in, in time as we, you know, we're, we're looking at things. And so, you know, you wouldn't be able to learn about, about the early universe. And if you're doing stellar stuff, you can use this, you know, you can't watch one star evolve through its whole lifetime, but you can look at lots of different stars at different distances and thus at different stages in their lifetime and then learn about evolution like that. So, so this finite speed of light, while annoying in some respects because it means you can't learn about everything is also super useful in other respects because it means you can learn anything. So I, I guess it, it wouldn't be completely impossible because we can still look at the current state and kind of infer how it got sure. to that state. But yeah, you, I hadn't really thought about the fact that the finite speed of light is actually this this blessing uh, in disguise. Yeah, I, it, it's, it, it's really subtle because it's, it's super irritating in, in certain ways, but also yeah. very useful in others. Cool. So we've actually had two people join us since I did the intro. So I'll let them now introduce themselves. They are in alphabetical order, Tillman and Valentina. So Tillman, do you want to quickly say who you are and uh, what you're interested in? Sure. Yes. Thank you. So I'm Tillman Tristram Burton, Edinburgh at the University of Edinburgh, mostly on like observational cosmology. So looking at weak gravitational lensing logical structure and trying to derive how the parameters that describe our universe. So I'm more on the observational side of things, but not at the level where I'm actually deal with the raw data that come out of the telescope. So I'm one step up from that, but not uh, a pure theorist either. So it's mostly a lot of applying statistics to data that other people have prepared for me. Cool, thanks. Uh, and yeah, Valentina, do you want to introduce yourself? So hi, everyone. I am uh, Valentina. I am a PhD student and uh, I'm working about the modified theories of gravity on galaxy scale. In particular, I worked with the refracted gravity, which is a novel modified gravity, which does not resolve to dark matter. And um, refracted gravity seems to properly model the dynamics of these galaxies. And now I am uh, working on some tests uh, still on galaxy scales by modeling the dynamics of elliptical galaxies. And uh, I am in the future to extend this theory uh, to model the dynamics of galaxy clusters and uh, to go also to larger scales. Awesome, thanks. Um, are there any other questions people have seen now in the Reddit AMA that they, they think are interesting and wanna, wanna talk about? If not, I can just go to the next most uploaded one, but please yeah, raise there, your hand. There was one. Yep. Um, there was one cool question about uh, the latest theoretical or experimental research on whether the universe is infinite or not. I yeah, I think, think that is the next most uploaded one as well. Um, so, yeah. This probably also ties kind of in the, in the question of is the universe curved or not? Because actually this is very much related to if it's infinite or not. Um, maybe we can have a quick vote before we start here <laughs> with kind of just a show of hands. Um, who thinks that the universe is um, flat or open? So let's go for open first. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, closed or open? So not flat. Uh, that's, that's two people. It's okay. Flat. And, uh, well, okay, I, I'll flat caveat my answer eventually. 
that universe. Okay, that's about, uh, I don't know, eight people. Okay, <laughs> so I, I think most people think that's flat. So let me first explain um, kind of what, what the relation is. So we can think the universe can either be flat, so it's like kind of like a large plane where you can just go infinitely in one direction and there's no really, we don't think that there is an end to the universe. There's an end to what we can observe. So there's an observer of the universe and it's, it's like 90 billion light years or so large. Um, but the, in theory, we think the universe would be infinitely large. But it could also be curved, kind of like the surface of a sphere. And when you would go long enough in one direction, you would kind of come out again from the other direction. And uh, this would happen if the universe would be, would be curved. And then it would be not infinite. And uh, maybe some of the people who want to say a bit more on, on either of the options. I, I see no one's put their hand up. So I'll, I'll jump in to have a tiny bit of a rant. Um, I, I kind of feel like asking whether the universe is infinite is, it's a fun question, but we, we can, I mean, it comes back to this finiteness of the speed of light thing again. We can only observe a certain distance away. Outside of that, in principle, there could be dragons. Like th th we can't observe any further away. So we can, we can have kind of early universe models that might imply an infinite universe, but we, we can't ever actually tell. We will never be able to tell whether the universe is infinite or not because we'll never be able to travel. We, we, can, we can always see a certain distance away and not know what's, what's further away. So um, even, even if the universe was perfectly locally flat, it could still be finite in extent. It's just, it's flat and then there's some edge, um, like a flat earth, I guess. But please don't take that too seriously, people listening on, uh, on YouTube. Um, uh, yeah, so, so I, I kind of feel like I, I, I wish the questions like this were normally framed about just like, what is our observable universe like? But I, I, I understand why people want to think about, wow, is the universe infinite or not? I just don't feel like it is a meaningfully answerable question. Um, so I don't know whether that's sparked anyone else to vehemently disagree with me, but please raise your hand and, and start vehemently disagreeing with me. No, I totally agree with you. And I think like, it's, I mean, to me, it's kind of, it's kind of pointless, like you said, because you can't see any further, right? So it really doesn't really matter not to me anyway. And it's also like the connections between whether something is flat and the, what the topology is like is very specific to the models that we assume as well. So it's, um, a lot of assumptions go into cosmology and those assumptions can connect things like the universe being flat and the topology being infinite. So I think there's like, there's a lot of subtleties here that are probably not worth getting into. <laughs> can you maybe just, uh, well, I mean, maybe I'm about to ask you to go into one of those subtleties, but, but you use the word topology. Do you want to just sort of maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I meant, yeah. So what I meant was, was kind of the connection that Stefan was making between a flat and a plane and, um, and closed and, and like the surface of a sphere. So those connections between um, curvature and topology are only applicable within very specific models. Yeah, cool. this is really abstract, so we should probably steer away from it. Yeah, I don't know if, if we. I mean, I, I'm I'm keen to try and go abstract. So long. I mean, I mean, obviously, as long as we try and keep it intelligible as well. But th there may be other questions that are kind of more definitively answerable, and maybe even in a more meaningful way. Um, I see. Ben now has his hand up, so have you have the floor? I think I think there was a second part to that question uh, that might be better answerable, which is that uh, there there's some cosmological models that might be infinite, but also some that are cyclical. So maybe let me slightly rephrase the question. So there there are some cosmological models where we think there might be something like a beginning like a, a, a big bang, um, like uh, inflation, for, for instance, as, as I talked about earlier. Um, other models are these kind of cyclical models where the universe expands and then kind of contracts and kind of re-expands. Um, so it's, it's a very cycle. And uh, in that case, uh, we do have some uh, potential hints as to how we can distinguish these scenarios. Uh, it will be very hard, but that might be an option uh, to get at least some insight into um, how, how the universe evolved over time, not necessarily whether the universe is infinite or not. That is something I completely agree uh, with Sean. Um, Arthur, do you have right. something? Uh, yes, so, so I guess this is 
Kind of a footnote, but uh, you might be thinking, well, uh, maybe if, if the universe is infinite, uh, what you could try doing is if you live forever, uh, then maybe you can go on a rocket ship and, and try uh, going out as, as far and as fast as you can. Uh, but, but actually, there's a problem with that, which is that the universe is expanding faster and faster. And so that there's actually a horizon at, at which uh, you can't actually go beyond and, and see more galaxies, uh, no matter how close to the speed of light you're, you're going. So so in, in, in that sense, the, the observable universe is finite. Um, it's sort of finite though, right? Like the, the, the amount of universe that currently exists that we could observe is finite, but it, because it's also growing, you could still travel an infinite distance. I mean, if, if, if it really is um, the, the simplest model. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, you have to, I guess one, one always has to be a little bit careful about precisely what one's saying. Um, the, 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 the volume that would ever be observable in the future is currently finite, but in the future will, would be infinite, I guess, is the most precise statement, given the, the, the models we, we currently have. Um, so Robert, you have your, your hand up. Um, Stefan has given a good point to me uh, in, in the text saying I could give a public, or someone could give a public level intro to some of the questions on Reddit, because some of them have, have some technical terms in them. So Robert, I'm assuming you're, you're wanting to talk about this current question, so I'll let you go, and then we can, then we can try and do, uh, do what Stefan was suggesting. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to to comment comment on what what you just said. I mean, well, the 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 volume is growing, but where we can, what what Arthur said before, where we can travel, this actually shrinks, right? Because of the accelerated expansion, the the horizon is shrinking, right? So, um, this needs to be taken into account, right? Because so we we see basically less and less of. Uh, I, I I feel like yeah, we're getting into a in the semantic universe? argument now. Like there'll be fewer and fewer galaxies, but the actual physical volume yeah. must be increasing, right? Like that, that is true. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, volume yeah, is okay. increasing, but uh, yeah, okay. I just want, yeah, yeah. If you want to travel, so it's a it's a good time to be a cosmologist because in the very far future it will be very empty here. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Can I just chime in and say I love this idea because I think it's going to be say I like I love this thought experiment that say humans could live on earth for like infinitely long and the expansion rate got to a point that it was faster than the speed of light. And so these future humans would like look up into the sky and see absolutely nothing, right. but they would see all of our astronomy textbooks and everything. And it would become <laughs> some kind of like weird religious cult or something that believes oh. that this stuff is actually true. Yeah. <laughs> and also yeah. Draw, draws a great line to the, to, to the great debate when it was not clear whether the universe was bigger than the Milky Way and in the very far future you would only see the Milky Way basically right so yeah exactly um, exactly they'll be like these people are idiots there's nothing out there <laughs> or the, the, the Milky Dromeda because I think Andromeda and the Milky Way are going to collide exactly yeah <laughs> ben, ben I saw your hand temporarily up but now it's no longer up uh, I guess you don't want to say anything yeah I just wanted to uh, to say that uh, yes the, the all the, the faraway galaxies are receding from us in an accelerated expansion. But as, as now kind of both you and Robert uh, clarified, uh, what these people in uh, 10 uh, billion years on Earth will see, will, and will always be able to see, is our Milky Way and uh, the, other, the other galaxies in the local group. Um, because they are gravitationally bound together, so they won't be kind of ripped apart uh, by by the expansion of the universe. It will just be that it will go back to this picture that uh, the, the ancient humans had, that there's just the Milky Way um, and there's nothing else out there. Yeah, or, or hopefully they'll trust our, our their, their ancient textbooks. I don't know, we'll see. Um, well, no, we won't see, but th they'll see. Um, so yeah, Stefan I, um, gave a good suggestion of um, going through some of the, the more technical questions and um, breaking them down. So the highest voted one with a kind of technical uh, term in it is what is currently the most promising or popular theory of baryon asymmetry generation? I wonder whether this person has accidentally hit on a blind spot amongst, like we've got quite a few people here, but we may actually not have any expert on that particular thing. If anyone is an expert, please put your hand up and unpack it if not i think we'll probably still be able to at least tell other people what baryon asymmetry generation means we might not know what the current most popular or promising theory is does anyone um want to put their hand up and 
declare themselves to be the, the, the expert. No, okay, does anyone want to put their hand up and declare themselves to be good enough? Ben, cool, <laughs> thanks. Indeed, so no expert here, but uh, essentially what, what Brian, Brian asymmetry is uh, or, or means is that uh, we, all of us um, sitting here, um, all, the, uh, all the things around us in our apartments, uh, earth and everything else is comprised of, of, uh, of matter. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, we know from particle physics that there's also antimatter. Um, now, in the very early universe, we think there was uh, there was a equal amount of matter, or almost equal amount of matter and antimatter. Uh, it was just generated during during the hot big bang. Um, now the big question is, why is there this very small asymmetry, um, and why is there uh, why are we here? Why are we comprised of matter and not antimatter? Uh, why is there anything here? Now there's there's in the theory community there's a quite a lot of debate, there's quite a lot of active research, uh, and quite a number of models and theories uh, how this could have come about. But as far as I know, at this point, there's no consensus. Um, and uh, we, we need future uh, observations to possibly be able to get some more insights into that. But it might be an outstanding question for quite some time because it seems to be a very hard problem. We have a handout from Arthur, so do you have further thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm not an expert about this, but uh, I also know that, uh, that, that from, the, from the particle physics side, there, there also have been some experiments of, uh, of, of trying to create, for example, a hydrogen atom, except made of antimatter. Um, and, and so, so that way the, the, the nucleus in the middle will be negative, and then the, the thing like the electron will actually, it will be positive, it's called a positron. And so, um, so, so people are, are working on, on trying to make uh, similar things to matter, except made out of antimatter, uh, and to see if there are any detectable differences uh, in, in the way that matter and antimatter behave. Because uh, under, uh, under our understanding right now, um, we, uh, th there's, there's no reason why, why our standard model would predict uh, that, that, that matter and antimatter would, would behave any differently apart from uh, just being different and having opposite charges and, and things like that. So yeah, I, I don't know what the state is, though. Yeah, yeah. Cool, thanks. Um, any, any other thoughts on that? No, okay. Uh, we have another upvoted question. I hope this isn't gonna hit a, hit a blind spot amongst us, but I have always been curious about how the X-ray jets on pulsars, uh, okay, I guess they mean get formed. Do you guys maybe know how and why they form? Anyone here who knows pulsars? Oh, oh no. well, Haley, yep. Well, I, I, I don't know pulsars, but <laughs> my PhD supervisor knows pulsars. So if anyone else wants to like jump in and override me, I can, I think I have a vague idea for where these come from. These come from. So it's my understanding that, I mean, for those who don't know what a pulsar is, a pulsar is a kind of neutron star, which itself is basically like a, just an extremely dense star. So if you just like squish stars down to like as tiny and tiny as you can get. Um, so this happens when they die, they go supernova and you're left over with um, a remnant, which is a really, really dense neutron star. And it's basically one of the most extreme forms of matter in the universe. And what pulsars are, they're really, really rapidly spinning neutron stars. So there are some kinds of them called millisecond pulsars, which it's all in the name, like they spin um, once every millisecond. So these things are just like rotating like insanely quickly, like it's ridiculous. But it's my understanding that what these X-ray jets are, uh, when these neutron stars are accreting matter due to like a, 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 a partner or like an accretion disk around them, because they're rotating so quickly and the matter is in such an extreme configuration, they also have very strong magnetic fields. So this means that when they accrete matter, it's my understanding that this matter kind of gets funneled out these magnetic fields at either of the poles and kind of like shot out into space um, through these by the magnetic fields. So this is a very hand wavy kind of way to go about it. But I think the gist is neutron stars, very extreme magnetic fields and accreting stuff blows out the poles. <laughs> That's my non-expert explanation. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. 
Cool. I, I guess there's no one here to, to, to disagree, so we'll we'll take it on. Uh... <laughs> Must be right then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, does anyone else? I, I see Ben has written in our in our, the Zoom chat that the question about what the next big development in gravitational wave observatories is is a, is a good one. I agree. So does does anyone in our chat who um hasn't said much yet want to tackle that one? Windsor, awesome. Yep. Tackle away. Yeah, I'm happy to give this one a try. Although I'm happy for other people to jump in if they have different opinions. So I think uh, from what I've heard in the gravitational wave community, the next big thing that's coming up is LISA, which is going to be a space-based observatory as opposed to LIGO, which is um, directly on Earth. So LISA is like, I think, three satellites that are going to be sent out into space. Um, to, and so it's going to observe gravitational waves that are at a very different frequency from LIGO. Um, and so they're gonna be looking at um, black holes that are, I think, much bigger than the types of black holes that LIGO is going to look at. Uh, what, one of the things that I think is really cool about LISA is just um, how well engineered I've heard it's going to be. So from a talk I went to just like a couple of years ago, it sounded like, you know, they're going to send these three satellites up into space and then they just leave it there to, to, to like orbit around for the next 10 years without having to do any kind of like orbital maintenance or anything. And so that's something that that kind of blew my mind about it. Yeah. Cool. Um, anyone want to, to add to that? Does, does anyone know what we should be expecting in the, I mean, I think Lisa is sort of like a decade or so away. There might be some, um, does anyone know what might be coming in the, in the nearer future? Ben, you have your hand up. Yes, yeah, so uh, LIGO and Virgo, or the two LIGO detectors in Virgo, these gravitational wave observatories or interferometers that are operating here on Earth uh, have, been op have been running for quite some time and you've probably heard uh, uh, about them uh, even in the uh, evening news. And uh, so they are still up and running, they upgrading. Uh, there will be new, uh, new detectors added. So uh, they, as far as I know, they, uh, they're, talking, um, they're talking about having at least five of these uh, ground-based uh, observatories running. And uh, that will allow us to do um, amazing science because then it will be getting much, much easier to combine uh, these gravitational wave uh, ob observations with the observations of light um, in this approach called multi astronomy, where we could then really see objects uh, both in gravitational waves and in light, which could shed a huge amount of information on uh, various aspects of physics. And then in addition, uh, there's more, um, more uh, dedicated uh, observatories planned as well uh, from various countries around, around the world that uh, really want to tap into this kind of unknown uh, field uh, and these kind of these, this parameter space that uh, is so far is eluding us. And uh, so definitely stay tuned for a lot of developments in gravitational wave astronomy over the next 10, 20 years. Cool, thanks. And people, people were sort of typing up some, some answers as you were going, so Kagra or, or something similar to that in Japan in, in the future. Uh, the Einstein Observatory, which is I think an underground gravitational wave detector that's being planned. LIGO India yeah, yes. in a few years too. Uh, yeah, and then Tillman talked about the Big Bang Observatory, which I don't think is is, is something that is like actually funded and, and might not, if it did get funded, necessarily even be in, within our lifetimes. But it's sufficiently exciting that, Tillman, do you want to have a go at uh, explaining what it actually is? I mean, only very non-experty. So while Lisa has three satellites that are quite far away because at a under the Lagrange point, the Big Bang Observatory is like you take three satellites that put them at different points in the orbit around the sun. So you have a, a baseline of an AU roughly to really measure the, the longest 
wavelengths that you could possibly measure for gravitational waves. So in principle, you could, or allegedly should be able to measure gravitational waves directly from inflation. But yes. So just for context, has... one AU is a distance from the Earth to the Sun. So that would be kind of how large we would build our experiment, which is really impressive. Yes, uh, but yeah, I think the time frame for that is like the next hundred years or something like that. Mm. <laughs> we can't even secure funding for the next five years, considering Lisa was almost cancelled not too long ago. Yeah, was... yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so they're, they're discussing away in, in the chat about what we should talk about next. Um, there was a question in YouTube, and, and it seems like some of us do actually potentially know the answer, or at least have speculation on the answer. So I'll read out the question and then put your hand up if you want to answer it. Why are the large galaxies located near the center of rich galaxy clusters more likely to be elliptical than spiral? In addition, how do these large elliptical galaxies form? So I, I guess the person asking that sounds like they're quite knowledgeable about, because um, I didn't even know that this was a true statement, um, but does someone want to unpack that a little bit and then also uh, answer the question. If no one puts a hand up, I'm going to pick on the people who've actually been typing. So, please put your hand up. Uh, Robert, I'm, yeah, Robert and Valentina have put their hand. Ah, oh, Stefan, you can't put your hand up, but if you want to also go, you can. You can no, speak. no, go ahead. Let, let the others speak a okay. little more. Uh, Valentina, you haven't you haven't said much. So, do you want to go first? Oh, you're muted. I think you're muted. I can unmute you if you want. Is Valentina trying to talk? I mean, I can. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Oh, okay. Uh, so I've studied it some years ago during my master thesis, so I'm not pretty sure. Um, I know that elliptical galaxies and galaxies are similar systems. So the one made of stars and the other one on bigger scales made of galaxies. So the um, rotation supported, so they are, um, have a hot gas uh, component and they have similar velocity dispersion profiles. Uh, and it seems the elliptical galaxies, uh, like galaxy clusters uh, follow the, okay, elliptical galaxies follow the potential well of galaxy clusters. So they have more similar properties uh, uh, with respect to spiral galaxies and galaxy clusters. Indeed, the uh, spiral galaxies are uh, rotation dominated. They have uh, a cold gas component. So uh, maybe it, um, looking at the properties, it seems that galaxy clusters and elliptical galaxies as uh, similar histories of different scales. Uh, Instead, the spiral galaxies have uh, undergone like a different emerging uh, um, processes, uh, so different histories uh, seen their different properties. I I hope to uh, Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, Answer Robert, you've also question. You've also got your hand up, Robert. Do you want to add something to that? Yeah. I mean, I. So first of all, I'm not an expert on galaxy formation, but maybe just um, briefly how how do how do um, elliptical galaxies form? So usually the picture is that you start with spiral galaxies and then via merger, for example, you you form um, so the two spiral galaxies or two galaxies uh, merge, and then you start forming these elliptical galaxies, which are which basically just a big cloud of stars with. Uh, as Valentina said, basically random motion, um, which are kept in their potential well. And this, this thing takes time. Um, and this is something we call basically in, in physics or in cosmology, we call virilization. And um, the timescales for this are quite long. And the same holds, uh, since they are similar physical objects, as Valentina pointed out, holds for galaxy clusters. So it's quite likely that you find massive elliptical it's at the center of, of, of massive clusters, for example. So that's my, uh, yeah, my guess on this. Okay, cool. Um, so does anyone have another question there they're keen to answer? I, some people have been writing in the chat that there's some that they're, they're keen to answer. This might be one that we, we 
definitely do actually have experts on, but there was a question that related to cosmological inflation. So maybe I can read that question out and then someone can have a go at a, um, answering it, if I can find that question. Uh, or if someone else, ah, here we go. Big billing inflation theory postulates a very rapid expansion of the universe in the very first time ticks of the universe. Then something changed and expansion continued, albeit at a much lower rate, possibly varying over the time since then. Do cosmologists have any models for the physical laws governing the universe during the inflationary phase? How are those laws different than what we observe in the universe today? What changed to terminate the inflationary era? So there's a lot to unpack there. Who wants to go first? I can start and maybe say a bit about what, what inflation is. Yeah, um, sure. Cool. So basically what we what we what our observation what our observations point at is that probably the universe had this, as the question said, this kind of phase of rapid expansion at the beginning. And then uh, this apparently stopped. And then the universe um, went through a few other phases of expansion that went at different speeds, usually much, 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 much slower. And uh, finally, now, kind of in, in the last last few billion years, the universe started expanding faster and faster again, but nowhere near as fast as during inflation. And we think there was some particle or some, 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 something that we call the infaton that caused this expansion. So um, it should, well, it's somewhat related to what we see today as kind of dark energy. So something that when it expands doesn't dilute. And this is kind of a special property that you, that you can find in kind of explain with some models. I'm not at all an expert on inflation. So I have, I don't actually know all those models. I'm sure some of the other conference attendees will know. Um, but when you have this property, then you will get a faster and faster going expansion. And this expansion was like ridiculously fast. Um, so if you imagine the number 10 to the 10 to the 30, so a 10 with 30 zeros behind it, that's a factor of by which the universe has grown at least. I think that's roughly the order of magnitude um, during inflation. So even really small things like quantum fluctuations that were there at the very kind of beginning of the universe, what were blown up during inflation, and actually those quantum fluctuations from very early in the universe now today form kind of the structures in the universe. So they, they were the seeds for all the galaxies and clusters we can see today. Um, and yeah, we have lots of models that can explain this and we're actually trying to figure out which of those are right. Um, but yeah, I can't, I can't give you the specifics for those models here. I, I might have a little bit of a go and others put your hand up while, while I'm talking if you wanna add to anything. So how are the laws different than we observe in the universe today? Well, as far as gravity goes, we don't think they are different um, during inflation. In fact, it, it's general relativity, the, the model of gravity that we, we think correctly describes the local universe that made us first think that there might be the possibility for this inflationary era. As um, Stefan said, at the moment, we, we're moving into an era called dark energy domination, which is possible in general relativity if you have a, a vacuum energy, so an energy that is the, the sort of lowest possible energy density um, of of your sort of fields and particles that are located in your universe. If it's a constant value, it actually causes an accelerated expansion. It, it has a negative pressure, uh, which is equivalent to a tension, which kind of pulls the universe apart a little bit. Um, and so the idea is that there's some other physical field. So this is where the laws will get slightly different that got excited up to a, a plateau and it's kind of um, how, it, how its energy evolves as the field value changes. And if it got stuck up into that plateau, then you could get the situation where throughout space, the energy density is almost constant and then you would get that accelerated expansion again. So the idea is that just as we're sort of moving into an accelerated expansion now, something happened from some other field that was in this very, very, very high energy density plateau and that caused the inflation. And so to answer the question, how did it end? The idea is that the field gradually evolved down this plateau everywhere in the universe and then at some point fell off the plateau and gradually over the rest of the universe, all the other bits um, fell off the plateau. And so that inflationary expansion, accelerated expansion phase ended. And then you ended up with a universe much more like what it was before dark energy came, which is a deceleration because there's a lot of um, normal gravity sort of decelerating everything. Um, so Robert Rice has his hand up for that. And then I think some people have said there's specific other questions they want to discuss. So we can, um, we can move to that after Robert has his say. Yeah, I just want to want to follow up on this a bit, right? Um, um, so because in the question there's where the laws of physics different 
um, and you, you partially answered this already, right? So we, when when we do when we do physics or we model the universe, um, we assume that the laws of physics which apply on Earth are the same everywhere in the universe, so that they are universal. However, one should also say that um, so there are also theories which predict um, that, for example, gravity behaves differently on cosmological scales, and then one would see an effect here, or that. I don't know that, for example, nuclear physics also behaves differently uh, in other parts of the universe, and then one would see an effect there. So this is this is studied, but in general, the assumption is that we can study here on Earth. We try to apply this to the basically to, to to the universe in our case or to any system, but this then has to be tested, of course, and this is in this sense also basically a test of the fundamental theories of of uh, physics um which is i think really important yeah yeah cool thanks i, I just want to kind of make maybe it's a, it's a semantic point it's, it's not a disagreement with you it, it's maybe just a clarification of, of the question of how are the laws different i guess it, it sort of depends on what shining pete um means by laws being different right because i was talking about this this field that gets excited up to its plateau when that field that field would still be around now it would just be at a much 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 lower energy density so depending on what you mean by laws of physics being different yes once that field gets up into its plateau forces that we know of like the strong nuclear force the electroweak force they'd look completely different so in some sense yes the laws of physics would be different but in another sense that other field is still here and if someone was to able to get it back up onto that plateau then it would it would still look like that so yes the laws of physics were different but no they weren't if hopefully shining pate is satisfied with that answer um so people are saying in the chat they'd quite like to discuss what's the one concept, idea, or theory you wish it was easier to explain to the general public. So I think a few people have, have said they're keen on that. Um, Alex, I think, is the one who said he was keen or, or they were keen and have said the least so far. So do you want to go first, Alex, then maybe Wenzel, and then Stefan? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I have a specific one. I just think that this is a really interesting question to bring up to a bunch of, of people. Um, I mean, certainly there, there are lots of questions that, that we, we were having a conversation about um, outreach generally at the, at the conference um, a couple of days ago. Um, and we were talking about, you know, difficult questions that, that we get. And I, I don't know if people would prefer to be able to explain, you know, because we get lots of questions like uh, we were discussing earlier, uh, you know, is, is the universe infinite? And these, these sorts of questions that or maybe interesting to think about, but aren't really scientific questions anymore because they, you know, assume that you can know things about unmeasurable things. Um, so I don't know if maybe that's a, a sort of area that people feel would be nice to be able to explain, you know, why, why that's maybe not as interesting to professionals uh, as as it is to lay people uh, or if there are particular topics that people wanted to talk about so, so no one's raised their hand so i'll stick to the original sort of suggestion and ordering windsor are you keen to, to have some thoughts on this oh uh, yeah i can start on my two cents um i guess i can start by saying there are probably many concepts I wish I was better at explaining to a general audience, but um, since I work on dark matter, this is one that comes up a lot for me, dark sector physics, um, because I think it's one of those like, those like hot topic kind of words that show up in popular science a lot. And so I sometimes, you know, end up in conversations with um, maybe people who don't who don't fully understand where the idea of dark matter or dark energy comes from. And so, yeah, I, I wish, I, I wish I had like, you know, like a less than one paragraph explanation for being able to explain to a person why we believe, uh, or why at least many of us believe that dark matter should exist um, without having to go into all the his like, without having to dive into like all the histories and experiments, different experimental evidence that we have. Um, but that's something I'm still gonna have to work on. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, so Stefan can't put his hand up because he's co-host, but he, he wants to go next and then I can get to Tillman and then Robert. Yeah, I, I think one of the concepts that I would I would really like to like have to be easy to understand or explain is kind of the, the, 
the kind of constant speed of light that, that was mentioned also before, that the idea of no matter what you do, no matter how fast you're moving, no matter in what work you're standing, the speed of light is always the same and like all the effects this has. So just if you try to think about this, I remember being in, in kind of class and you know having having relativity uh, classes and kind of trying to, to think about this concept and it gives you so much, it, it shows you how weird the universe is, right? And like just thinking about, oh, so the light has to be the same speed. So then the the space has to contract and time has to slow down just to make this work. And thinking about all this and getting this to explain, it takes quite a lot of time, but it's also really interesting and fascinating. So I think that's really, really cool. Um, actually, I th I, a few days ago, I only learned that, that Sean actually made a game uh, about this. Which no, is no, Sean, Sean didn't make a down. game. Sean, Sean just loves the game. Sean was not involved okay. in the preparation of the game at all. <laughs> Okay, Sean, Sean, Sean I wish I was involved called, in the game, but I... That there is a game called Velocity Raptor, where you can play a raptor running at close to the speed of light. It's really fascinating. I just played it yesterday. Yeah, I guess we'll we'll add a... Um, so someone can add a link to the game in the in the Reddit thing, and maybe we can also add it as a comment in the, in the YouTube or something. Um, cool. Okay, so we've now got three hands up. Um, Tillman, I think I said, was, was next, and then Robert, and then... Right. Well, I guess it's a bit in the game a step further from the what we had from Alec. Like, there's the questions that border on more philosoph philosophical that you can't come up with a, a scientific answer. But then, from a more like practical standpoint, many of the, the big questions, let's say, about inflation from an observer's point of view, those we can't really answer either because we are fed uh, or held up with more mundane things on how the atmosphere messes our pictures as coming in our telescopes. So at the moment, from an observer's point of view, we can barely deal with the data we have and answer, well, is the expansion rate uh, 72 or 66? Um, so from my point of view, I don't even get around to think what the, the big questions are because I'm preoccupied trying to get uh, the basics running. So there's different levels of um, of grandeur that you can think in. And depending on who you talk to, the different levels get can maybe missed. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, Robert, then Valentina. Yes, so I mean, honestly, it's really hard to pick one. There's so many um, and very oh, interesting. So one, for example, that one of those that is I find always pretty hard, but also interesting is just the expansion of space itself. I mean, it's always it's like the typical questions like what is it expanding into? And it also immediately raises the question of so what is beyond the universe? And all these kind of difficult questions also gets a bit philosophical very quickly. And of course, you can do stuff like you have this balloon, and if you expand it, you see like dots on the balloon might uh, get further away from each other. But then really having the step in mind to get to one dimension higher, really three spatial dimensions in one in time, that, that, that doesn't get that's really hard uh, also for myself to wrap your head around it. So I think that's one difficult concept to try to get over the concept that space doesn't have to expand into anything. It can expand on its own just by the way we measure things uh, moving through it. So yeah. I, I just want to pigeonhole that I want to talk about that um, exact thing point uh, after Valentina's had her, her chance. So Valentina, do you want to have a go? So okay. I'm, I agree with uh, Wenzel to explaining the uh, concepts of dark matter and dark energy to the general public, but uh, I would um, I think that people should also add the concept of uh, modified gravity as uh, an alternative explanations like the idea that the generativity is an extension to the gravity we observe on Earth, like uh, um, u equal to mgh and uh, the modified gravity is a generalization to gr that we observe like on the earth and on the solar system so it uh, would be it would be great always to accompany the, the two approaches, so the dark component and the modified the theories of gravity, like in, in general sense. Um, thanks, Valentina. I think, unfortunately, your connection is not great. I, I hope that it's coming through well on YouTube. Um, but 
Uh, the, the other person with the hand up is Arthur. Oh, yeah, and then so uh, I was thinking, uh, I guess uh, something else that, that I wish would be easier to communicate would be uh, like, uh, why, we, why should we uh, trust the scientific method at all? Because uh, in, in, in some sense, you, you, can't, you can't like rigorously prove that you should believe in science uh, or something like that. It's, it's all about looking at evidence and, and then kind of extrapolating. So uh, I feel like the only explanation that, that we can really give is just giving lots of examples of, of how science works. And, uh, and and how we're, we're able to to predict interesting things that uh, uh, that, that be backed up by more evidence later and things like that. But but the the concept itself, I, I guess, is, is kind of hard to to justify. I don't, I don't. Yeah, yeah, going very meta on the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I um I just wanted to, to mention related to what Robert Robert was saying. Um, I think that uh, I, I'm really keen to start getting interactive stuff made that's why i'm so in love with velocity raptor and i'm so in love with velocity raptor that i accidentally tricked stefan into thinking i made it um the i think the expanding universe is something that could be really well explained by an app and i actually even know how much it would cost it would cost about forty thousand euro to get the guy who made velocity raptor to make an expanding universe thing which would be like a um a two-dimensional thing where the mat is kind of moving away and you can move around in your in your thing and go somewhere else and then you would see that as you move you're no longer the, 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 your previous point is no longer looking like the center of the universe you can move to this new place and see that everything's moving away from you there you could go forwards and backwards in time and see how um all, all of these things like horizons where there, there's two types of horizons right like there's the horizon where in the past nothing further away from there could have got to you by now and then there's the future horizon nothing would there's, there's nothing you wouldn't be able to get to interact with something that's a certain distance away all of this stuff could be quite well explained concepts about like what is flatness what's its impact what is openness so um yeah maybe maybe watch this space and in the future we might um be able to be talking about an app that's actually being produced um like that i don't have any thoughts on how to yeah I, i'd never really thought about the, the even more meta question of why is science actually useful and, and a way to, to really viscerally get that across um anyone have any more thoughts on the what is the most interesting thing. So someone wrote in the in the chat, general relativity, uh, and, and I definitely agree with that. I think um, this velocity raptor has achieved a way of doing this with special relativity. Um, I, th I feel like general relativity might be possible, but no one's done it yet. It would be very difficult. Quantum mechanics, I think, is the, the holy grail in, in this sphere of, of how do you actually get across what is, what is actually happening in quantum mechanics, when almost by its very definition, quantum mechanics says you can't find out what's actually happening. You can only look at the measurements. So it's some way of getting the maths across intuitively without having to actually sit down and study the maths would be really cool. And I don't have any great ideas on that. I, I mean, I have ideas, maybe not great ideas. Um, so if anyone wants to, uh, to put their hand up on this particular topic, here's your chance. Otherwise we can look at another question. I think that there was at least one question that people were discussing in the chat, but I would have to scroll up quite far. So if, if someone's got another question you want to move to now is the time or i'll just go back to reddit and try and find which one it was um does anyone know anything about the stowell underground physics laboratory i've never heard of it before i um, I, I haven't heard of it ah go ahead i, I hadn't ahead, heard uh, i hadn't heard about it before either but i saw the question so i looked into it um a little bit uh so uh also to everyone on youtube as well as everyone here in in the zoom room uh so it is uh an underground uh, laboratory that's currently excavated in australia so as far as i understand it's supposed to be a similar uh, laboratory site um that uh, like similar to say snow lab in the us or uh, similar in, um, in Italy. And what they want to do is uh, they want to put uh, dot matter detectors and other experiments there, which have to be shielded from uh, all these cosmic rays and everything else that is kind of bombarding Earth in order to limit the, um, the background that uh, that would otherwise not make these experiments possible because that matter, for, ex for example, is interacting so weakly that we, sh we really want to try to 
to limit any other things that could could interact with it uh, or with with our detector. And so at the moment, they're really uh, they're digging out um, these these caverns, um, and then I think they they hope to be able to finish that uh, by the end of the year or sometime ne sometime next year, and then put in the infrastructure um, and get the first um, the first uh, experiments there uh, in the time scale over the next few years. Uh, so there will be some time until we hear more about it. Uh, in the physics literature, but it should come up uh, soon. And I expect uh, great things coming out of that. Um, any, any, anyone else adding to that? Um, I, I just want to before that, so we'll go to the Starlink question and then the energy one. But I just wanted to point out something that's quite amusing because one of our panelists has been had their post removed comment removed by the auto moderator. Um, so, so ask science have this thing where, where science experts can have a sort of semi-moderator status and I'm, I'm one of those people so i can see that the post that's been removed and, and i think it probably should be removed because ask science is supposed to be about serious scientific discussion and robert reich has responded to someone who was just saying hi with a joke about no one expects the timish inquisition so i think it was just love from haifa israel nobody expects the timish inquisition so no memes in our ask science robert or auto moderator will will remove it. And I, I think it's probably removed it because you've you've written some, I think it's very close to Monty Python quote. So well done, auto moderator, you've, you've successfully uh, found a place you need to remove. Um, so yeah, we've got the Starlink one and the, the energy one. Does anyone want to tackle the Starlink one? Who's the sure. most, I, Tillman, cool, you're probably the most appropriate person for that. Well, most, so I don't actually deal with the raw pixel data it comes from these telescopes, but so in general, the, the answer is it depends. Uh, maybe um, for the person who asked the question probably oh. doesn't know what Starlink is, but just for the audience, what, what is Starlink? Right, so um, SpaceX started um, putting up satellites into orbit uh, to basically provide internet access to the whole world. The issue is there are lots of them. The plan is to have something like 40,000 satellites sometime soonish. Uh, and when a satellite basically crosses across your image in a telescope, while the satellite still illumined by the sun, that shows up as a very bright streak across your image. Now there have been lots of talk and pictures about nice astronomy pictures being ruined by satellite trails. And the question is, how does it actually affect, let's say, professional astronomers? And so I'm not the one that um, programs where the telescopes are looking, but from what I gathered, yeah, the answer is it depends. So for the, the Rubin Observatory, you might have known it as LST before, um, the estimate is that about 30% of all images will have at least one Starlink, Starlink star, uh, satellite trail in them. So that's a, a massive fraction. And you could count how many pixels that affects and how much longer you would have to observe the sky to get the same and that's money in the end. Um, but there are mitigation strategies. So one, you know where the satellites are or when they are coming. So you're not usually surprised by them in a sense, but because like LST covers the sky so much and in so large, uh, pictures, you can't basically avoid them. There's always going to be, almost always going to be some satellite trail in there. Now, um, SpaceX said to try to make the satellites a bit darker so they're not showing up as brightly, so it will help. Um, but it's always going to be difficult because yes, you ha have to streak in there and you can remove it, but especially for cosmological applications, for example, you are very sensitive to like orientation of the things you're looking at. So in weak lensing, you need to measure the, the shape of your galaxies, which are basically just faint blobs of pixels to precision in the sub percent level. Now, if you have some long thing in your image, it, it can be easy that that gets confused with elongated galaxies, which would mess up the, the cosmology signal that you're looking for. But the fact is that especially because the satellites show up during uh, dusk and dawn, if you want to observe 
asteroids, for example, so you don't miss the killer asteroids, it's going to destroy us all. Um, those will be especially bad in, in these uh, observing times. But the official um, statement is basically it's a nuisance, it's not catastrophic, but yeah, can't really do anything about it. Awesome, thanks. Any, anyone else have any thoughts about Starlink? No? Okay, I think we, we've had at least one person join, but probably only one person. So yeah, Katie, do you want to just introduce yourself and Hello. what you're an uh, expert on yeah, within um, cosmology? I'm Katie Mack. Um, uh, yeah, in cosmology, I, I study the early universe, dark matter, black holes, uh, the end of the universe, galaxy formation, Lots of weird stuff. Cool, thanks. Um, maybe I'll get you to answer the question. We, I think we all answered at the beginning, although maybe um, Valentina and Tillman also missed this one. Um, what is the holy grail in terms of like possible future research or results that, let me just find the exact way that this person framed the question because it was quite a good way they framed it. What future measurements or observations are cosmologists most excited about? What would be the holy grail? I'm a little bit biased because of what I research, so I, I'm probably going to have to say dark matter. Uh, you know, it would be really great to know what dark matter is. Um, but I think also dark energy, you know, it's most of the universe. Uh, it might destroy us someday. We should probably figure it out. Um, and, uh, and cosmic inflation, you know, we want to know if the universe really did go through that um, that whole thing in the beginning and what might have been before that and you know what the the very earliest evolution of the universe was so those are those are the three i don't know if i'd want to pick exactly one of them but yeah cool fair enough uh tillman and valentina if you want to answer that feel free if you if you don't want to that that's fine um yeah i think there have been I lots of great oh sorry i should have oh, said cool. in ordering uh, tillman and valentina sorry about that yeah, I think there have been lots of great holy grails to talk about. As I said before, from my point of view, we won't get to many of these in our lifetimes, probably. Um, so personally, I would just be happy if we can analyze the data we already have or will get over the next 10 years or so in a way that we don't have to worry about um, things we missed. So knowing how far our galaxies are away if we don't have spectra, for example. So very practical uh, problems, but that will define if LSST and Euclid and Desi and so on can actually deliver on the promises they make and then answer the holy grail questions that have been proposed here. Awesome, thanks. Uh, yeah, and, and Valentina. Also the measurement of primordial gravitational waves. Uh, so hoping with the will be achieved in the future so to, to have more answers about the Big Bang. Awesome, thanks. Um, right, so we, we kind of initially decided we might go for just sort of 90 minutes. Um, so the only one I can see that someone has wanted to talk about that's left is Stefan said, I can talk about the energy one if no one else wants to. I, I don't think I've seen, I don't think I've seen the energy one yet. So Stefan, do you want to introduce the energy one and then you and others can, can answer it? Oh, now I have to search the energy question, question again. Um, I think it was about um, what exactly energy is. So the person asked, um, they thought basically energy is kind of like kind of uh, like electrons flying around like kind of what we would call kinetic energy and now that we know about kind of dark energy and all these things what actually is energy like what what do what, what would the physicists um, understand other energy and i think kind of the most textbook kind of answer would probably be kind of the the ability to perform some kind of work right so when you when you want to lift up a water bottle from the from the floor to the table you need to use some energy or if you want to drive a car from A to B, or you want to send a rocket to Mars, or you know you want to, I don't know, um, get get a get a spacecraft away from the cold. These are all things that need energy. And basically, 
you can talk about different kinds of energy. So you can, for example, uh, when you're talking about, a, let's say, a spacecraft that's flying around a, a planet or a star, it, close, it has some kind of gravitational energy what we, is what we say. And let's say you have a, have a spacecraft that's in, in orbit and it can fall down on Earth. And when it falls down, and it converts this gravitational energy that it has kind of up above in the orbit into kinetic energy when it falls down. Maybe another spacecraft, maybe let's take a meteor instead. And so basically you notice this meteor, kind of, at first it's kind of well far um, away from Earth and it comes close and gets faster because it falls down. And then you notice actually it, it stops going faster because, the, um, because of air drag and it starts to blow. So it's heating up and this energy, it's not converted to speed anymore, but into, well, heat, you could say. So those are kind of all ideas of energy. And now I guess the big question for all the cosmologists in the room, what is dark energy? And I'm not maybe the best person to answer this. So if anyone wants to put up their hands before I start explaining it. Um, okay, it's me then, I guess. Um, so what we observe is that the universe, as we observe it today, is expanding. That's fine, we, we understand that. But then we notice it's expanding faster and faster with time. And something kind of has to, I mean, this is a very, it's kind of an analogy. It's not completely correct uh, when I say this this way. But you could say something has to do this acceleration. Something has to make the universe go faster. And you need energy to make the universe go faster. And we don't see this energy anywhere. We have no idea what it is or where it comes from, or actually what makes the universe go and expand faster and faster. And that's why you call it dark energy. And it's kind of, astronomers have this, this idea of, we just call things dark something if we don't understand it. So there you go, dark energy. Cool. Um, unless anyone wants to say something on that, we, we kind of decided we'd go for 90 minutes, which is nearly up. Um, Katie, it turns out, it's good that she joined us because she says she uh, was at least once, maybe still is involved in SUPL, which was, um, I forgot what that stands for, but maybe Katie can remind us what it stands for. Do you want to just it's, give us a- Yeah, it's the answer. Stahl Underground Physics Laboratory. Um, so it's a, it's a new, it's a new uh, facility in Australia, um, just outside of Melbourne, uh, uh, about an hour and a half drive, I think, out, or no, a couple hours drive outside of Melbourne in an, an old gold mine. Um, and so basically what happened was there was this, this gold mine in this little town called Stahl uh, that was running low on gold and looking for new things to do with the, with the mine and uh, looking for, uh, for some kind of interesting possibilities. So they, they hired someone to, to investigate what, what kinds of things are out there. Um, and, uh, and that's when I got an email from this developer saying, hey, um, I read an article in The Economist about underground physics labs and you were quoted, do you, do you guys want a, a gold mine <laughs> to, to do some physics in? Um, and so we ended up uh, putting together a dark matter detector project. It was actually, th there was a proposal for a dark matter detector project in the Southern Hemisphere in Australia before that and the, um, and the, the physicists at University of Melbourne had been looking for a place to do it, but, um, but you know, it wasn't until that, that kind of connection that, that things really got going. So anyway, so they've been working on that. They've excavated a new space in that lab to do the, the detection. And the, the reason that you wanna do an underground dark matter detection in Australia is because we're trying to test the we're trying to reproduce or, or you know, rule out the result from an experiment called DAMA, uh, which was done in the Northern Hemisphere and found this annual modulation of, of dark matter, uh, well, of potentially dark matter signal. So they have a signal that's, that's stronger at a certain time of year and, and weaker at another time of year. And that's consistent with what you, should, what you would expect to see from dark matter as the Earth is going around the sun. Um, because it's going different directions at different times of year. Uh, but there is always the possibility that, that we're not seeing that, we're actually seeing a seasonal effect because also as you go around the sun, the tilt with respect to the sun changes. And so one time of the year is summer and the other time is winter. And so there are lots of things that might change in the summer and winter. So if you do the same experiment, but on the other side of the earth, then you're switching the seasons, but keeping the motion around the sun the same. And so the idea behind the the Stahl uh, underground physics lab, the the, um, the dark matter experiment there, which is called Saber, the idea is to to 
you know, flip the seasons, but but not the dark matter and see if you get the same result. And so I think it'll be another year or two before uh, results actually come out with it, but uh, it's certainly an exciting project and uh, I'm glad I was involved in it at the beginning and uh, I'm interested to see where it's going to go. Cool. Yeah. So, so I guess reading between the lines, you were a bit more involved than just being involved. You, you were one of the people who it wouldn't have happened without, I guess. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's unclear because they had been, you know, they had been contacting different uh, minds, but it's true that oh, they didn't yeah. hear back from anybody until uh, until oh, yeah. I made that connection. So okay. I don't know. We'll um, so, so the specific answer to what has it been up to is taking data, stay tuned for results within a couple of years, I guess. Uh, well, yeah, I don't know if they're actually taking data yet or not, but they've definitely excavated the space. They have a whole bunch of funding. Um, so it's it's in progress. So so that's 90 minutes. Um, uh there's no reason talking to the, the cosmologist here why we can't do this again next Friday. So let's maybe wrap up for now so that we don't leave a three hour long video on the on the channel um, and consider whether we want to leave a three hour one long next week. Um, does anyone want to just have any parting words or does everyone want to have a parting word? I'll, I'll give everyone a chance to just say, um, I don't know, what's a good question to do a, on, a, on a parting word? What, what are you... Um, we had the holy grail one at the beginning. Let's now go and do a, a more modest one of what do you think within the next 18 months might actually be discovered that is the most interesting thing in that 18 months that's realistic. Um, maybe, that, maybe I should have asked you this in advance rather than right now. Let's do that as the ending to the next one, perhaps. But if anyone has a, has a thing they want to say right away, do it. Otherwise, we can wrap it up. Or is there anything else from the AMA that, um, oh yeah, there was this one last question. Okay, we'll, we'll very quickly go over what particle and nuclear physics observables accessible to current or future, near future experiments are most important for your work. Um, so yeah, who, who wants to have the parting word on, on that? And of course we can type up more detailed answers on Reddit as well. Alexandra, okay. You got your hand uh, up first. Very, very crudely, uh, astrophysics has spent the last one and a half centuries caring mostly about photons. And I think photons will stay important for us. Uh, we'll spend, stay our main uh, motivator from uh, radio to gamma rays for at least uh, the next century. Uh, <laughs> Sorry I, to the gravitational I, wave people. I don't want to be rude, but. <laughs> I think, I think this, the person who asked this question is, is actually flared as a nuclear physicist. So I think this is actually a nuclear physicist asking like really specifically what particle and nuclear physics observables, like what can their community do to, um, to help us. So, so some people were answering neutrinos, which I think makes sense. Uh, and I guess dark matter, if something like the LHC were to make dark matter, that would also make a lot of sense. Um, anyone I want to add to that? I think, I think we should find out as much as we can about the Higgs particle, so. Yeah. And that's not, that's not for the nuclear th physicists necessarily, but uh, in but terms of particle, particle theory, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, any, any other thoughts? Otherwise, we can wrap up. And uh, thanks. Thanks all of the cosmologists for joining us. Thanks um, all of the, who, I don't know how many people who's been watching, but thanks for the people who, who've been watching. Um, if you're seeing this from Reddit later on, thanks for, for watching. Hopefully we'll answer some more questions and with some reasonable probability, stay tuned and we'll, uh, we'll see you next week.